So good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's ANU Canberra Times Meet the Author with Jane Harper. I'm Anna Creer and I review crime fiction for the Canberra Times. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and for me in Canberra that's the Ngunnawal people. We pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to thank Colin Steele, the convener of Meet the Author, for facilitating tonight's conversation, and to Pamela Randis and Pan Macmillan, Jane's publishers. Tonight, Jane and I will be in conversation for 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll go to questions that have been sent in by you, our virtual audience, and we'll close about seven o'clock. Jane Harper really needs no introduction. She's the multi award winning best selling author of The Dry, The Force of Nature, and The Lost Man. Her books have been published in 40 countries, which is extraordinary. Her first novel, The Dry, has been made into a major motion picture with Eric Banner, and hopefully we can talk a little about that later on. Her first, fourth book, The Survivors was, oh dear, oh, hang on, I'll get it there in the end. Her fourth book, it's the background. <laughs> the fourth book, The Survivors, oh, I give up. It is, it's here in my hand. The fourth book, The Survivors, was released last week in Melbourne, in lockdown, and it is already top of the Australian bestsellers chart. It's an atmospheric and moving story of grief, guilt, and adolescent relationships. So hello Jane and welcome to meet the author. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure, it really is. How do you feel about releasing a book in these strange times and not touring and not meeting your readers? Yeah, it's, it's pretty different. I mean normally um, when the book comes out um, I get to go around, yeah, go around to different bookshops around the country and yeah and, and get that opportunity to meet readers which is one of the best things I think because um you know writing is such a like a solitary endeavor and you spend a lot of time alone at the computer so um it's it's nice like it always feels like a lot more real when you actually get out there and and you know meet people who sort of who are reading it and they're holding it in their hands and it sort of feels a lot more um like it's actually um it's actually being published so um yeah it's a little bit weird doing it in lockdown um like i mean i still haven't seen it in a shop but see photos of it in shops elsewhere so i know it's sort of out there but um but having said that also it's great to kind of have these virtual um you know virtual opportunities because um you know, it means you can kind of reach, you know, maybe readers who wouldn't be able to come to a, a live event for, you know, geographic or various other reasons. So thank you so much for hosting this. I really appreciate it. That's good. That's good. You had a thousand at your launch, which is extraordinary too, really. I mean, we haven't got a thousand tonight, but you do have an audience. Now, let's talk about your book, The Survivors. In Tasmania. Why did you choose Tasmania this time? Yeah, I mean, the setting is a really important part of the, the novels and, and um, it's something I think about really early. So as soon as I'm kind of, you know, thinking about, I guess, like the, the real core of the plot and, and settle on an idea, I'm, I'm immediately thinking, like, where am I going to set this? And, um, you know, the core of the survivors is this you know, story set in um, like a coastal um, you know, sort of small town with like this really kind of rugged seascape. And, um, you know, and, and I mean, I think Tasmania was a really natural fit for that. It, that was that was quite an, an easy choice um, because I think it ticks all those boxes. It has a lot of those really small sort of tight knit coastal communities that rely heavily on tourism nowadays. And um, it has like the, you know, it has that kind of beautiful visual landscape that I wanted as well. So um, yeah, it was, it was a decision I made like really early on. You've been praised a lot for your appreciation of the Australian landscape. Um, one, one reviewer said that you make Australia a fully fledged character and you yourself have said that places need to have a ring of authenticity and that's why you took your road trip before writing The Lost Man. So what did you do this time? Did you go to Tasmania? What did you have to do before this place, Evelyn Bay, came into your head? 
Yeah, so I did. I did the same um, as um, as a, exactly the same as I did for the Lost Man. Actually, I I, I did. Um, I, I went to um, went down to Tasmania and did a, a kind of on the ground research trip, which is really I think a really important part of the writing process for me. And um, I like to do it at the same point in the novel, which is when um, I've got. So what I do first of all, I spend a long time kind of researching, you know, what I can from you know from my desk, I guess, like reading a lot about it and interviewing people on the phone. And, and getting a lot of the, the kind of basic kind of core knowledge I need to sort of build this um, fictional but hopefully recognisable, um, you know, Australian setting. And then um, I, I'm sort of putting the plot together and I'm, you know, I, I like to get kind of a, a, a loose sort of first draft completed, which um, allows me to kind of spot those gaps in my knowledge and I can I can work out what things are, you know I'm still missing and and what I need to know and it's also enough um, wiggle room still to you know rewrite or redirect things if I need to depending on what I learn on my research trip um, so it's quite a focused trip and I, I kind of know what I'm looking for and um, a lot of that is things like you know it is it is things like the, the you know visually the setting and um, but also things like I guess you know what um, what kind of things you know, people talk about when you sort of speak to locals and um, what sort of their experiences are kind of growing up maybe in, in a particular place, um, you know, um, and also specific. So for example, in, um, in the survivors is a, um, a diving scene because Tasmania has quite a, a rich sort of diving, um, you know, I guess, you know, um, opportunities, which you can't get in a lot of other places in Australia. And they have like a lot of shipwrecks and things like that. And I really wanted to include that element because I thought that was a really great sort of aspect of the state. Um, but I'm not a diver and I don't have um, the experience to write a scene like that without having done it. So I, I booked him to, to go diving in Tasmania and <laughs> yeah, and got, got to go, got to go down, um, you know, and, and kind of, you know, just feel what that was like really. And, and everything like the kind of the wetsuits they use and the um, safety talks and the, the sort of the sea life, you know, you can see and what it, you know, temperature the water's like and things like that. So it was really, um, it was really great. And it's always so useful. Like I always come back with like, you know, way more than I expected to get from these trips. Um, and then it's a question of, I guess, cherry picking the best of it to weave through the book. Well, that explains why that scene is so vivid, because it really did read as if you'd done it. And that was one of my questions, whether you had actually done the dive, because it, it was so, so alive, so, so extraordinary. So, and actually, as I was saying earlier, and she was very impressed with the way you've captured um, the coldness of the sea. The, the isolation, especially when the tourist season finishes, and as well as that, the concept of living almost on the edge of the world with only Antarctica down, only Antarctica over the horizon. So I thought you might like to know that it's, um, and the caves, the yeah. caves are so, they're so vivid too. Are they based on, on somewhere real? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I mean, the whole, um, you know, whenever I'm kind of building um, a setting, like I, I absolutely try and, you know, use as much um, real life, you know, I guess real real life parts of the setting as I can, but then also fictionalise it. So, um, you know, I want it to be um, somewhere where hopefully people who are, you know, familiar with Tasmania to, to any degree really, you know, recognise it and, and it has that kind of, you know, um, you know, yeah, so the authentic ring to it, um, but at the same time, not recognisably any particular place, because it feels really important when you're writing fiction to, you know, for me anyway, to fictionalise that setting. Um, and, um, but yeah, you should try and draw in all those little, little elements. Um, so I'm really, yeah, I'm happy, you know, if your, your friend who's, um, who's from there, you know, recognise it, that's, that's great to hear. Thank you. That's great. Anyway, the story, you tell the story from Kieran's perspective. He's your main character. And he's still affected by his guilt from the past. Um, guilt seems to be a recurring theme in your novels. Would you like to comment on that and on Kieran too? Yeah, sure. So the, um, uh, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, it's um, told um, yes, essentially through the eyes of the main character, who's a guy called Kieran Elliott, who is 30. Um, and he... Um, he 
has a, a partner and a young, very young baby daughter. Um, and he grew up in this small town in Tasmania. And um, when he was um, a teenager, he made some bad decisions that led to um, a, a sort of devastating consequences for him and his family. And um, he then moved away to go to university and kind of move on with his life. And to some degree has you know, done that with um, you know, a measure of success. Um, but he still, um, you know, he still sort of carries a bit of, a bit of um, weight, this, this past experience. So he returns to, um, to his hometown to help his parents who are, who are struggling for various reasons. And, the, um, and I think, you know, I really like, you know, what, what I think really like about his character is that of, that's, um, idea of him sort of coming home but as a, as a sort of a different person with a little bit more maturity and a bit of um, hindsight, I guess, which allows him to sort of reflect on things that I think, you know, many of us have that experience of going back to somewhere, you know, we, we very familiar with or where we grew up. And, you know, the years have kind of changed you a little bit and it maybe uh, invites you to reflect on the decisions you made or things you did or um, things you, you know, you thought to be true that maybe, you know, with those extra years, um, aren't quite as solid as you thought. Um, and I think that's the real kind of, that was, that was a really interesting part of Kieran's character to, to write about. And you can see the difference between him and his, his perspective from that of his two friends who have remained and who have remained in this small town and don't have the broader experience. Evelyn Bay is a very, very interesting place. You have one of your characters say, in a place like Evelyn Bay, people know each other business. And another says, places like this, they need to be tight knit to work. Once the trust is broken, they're stuffed. So tell us about, you, you. can I say that the day after Kieran returns home, there's a body on the beach? Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. There's a body on the beach. So tell us about the reaction of the locals to the murder especially the difference between the men and the women, and also the really quite remarkable role played by, I just want to get the name right, the Evelyn Bay Community Hub Online. Yeah, yeah so um, I think yeah, that, was, that was something that was actually um, quite an interesting part for me to write, which was the reaction of the community when um, a, a body is found um, on the beach. And it was sort of... Um, you know, it, it, I, I often talk about how sort of themes start to emerge as I'm as I'm writing, um, and they they sort of start to present themselves rather than, you know, me setting out with a theme in mind when I start. And this was one point when I really I thought like, um, you know, that 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 kind of theme, I guess, of the difference between, you know, the experience men and women have in 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 similar situations, really started to emerge because you know, when I was writing about the reactions of people in the town to a body being found, it's, um, people react very differently, you know, depending on, on who you are. So, um, for example, you know, Kieran, who's 30, and, you know, young and fit, and, um, you know, he has no problem, you know, walking through town at night and um, just continue sort of living his life, really, whereas his, his partner, who's the same age, but, you know, um, doesn't doesn't like to she won't go on the beach anymore on her own you know so and and you know and it's things like that I think that really kind of highlights um, you know people people can have a, a shared experience but their their reactions and how it impacts them can be can be very different. And the surf and turf at the end of the beach did you base that that was so it seems so real too with its lobster in shells on the side. Is that something you saw or, or is that pure imagination? Um, I did see something similar to that actually um, on, on, my, on my Tasmanian road trip. Um, I'm trying to remember where it was now. It was, it was, a, it, it was somewhere I, we kind of stopped, stopped by the side of the road really. And there was um, uh, yeah, a, a, a restaurant which had um, kind of a sea life creature made out of shells on the side, which I thought was a really fun detail. And it's things like that, I guess, that you like to kind of, uh, are really good to kind of, you know, include those sort of small details that, um, you know, I think um, hopefully give a place a little bit of character without, without I think, overloading the reader with a lot of, you know, a lot of um, detail or description that's going to slow the story down. It, you want to kind of drop these things in um, 
you know, uh, so it sort of it sort of naturally builds a picture rather than force feeding it. I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, Kieran as well, because of his of his guilt and what has happened, suffers from PTSD. And you mentioned Beyond Blue in your acknowledgements. Can you tell us what you learned from consulting them about this this condition? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the, I mean, there's, like I was saying, so I obviously try and do like a, an underground kind of you know, physical um, research trip. But I think a really important part as well is to seek out experts in areas um, you know, the areas that you're going to touch on to make sure they're kind of accurately and sensitively um, portrayed. Uh, and one of those was this kind of, um, this ongoing sort of theme of, of grief and guilt and the impact that has on people's lives and in different ways as well. Again, people react very differently to similar situations. And so I, um, I spoke to one of the um, lead clinical advisors from Beyond Blue, which as you know, I think we all would know is a mental health charity. And, um, that was really fascinating and I learned so much from from them um so I'm really you know, really grateful to them for kind of giving me their time because I know they have like a lot of requests but um it was you know I think um one of the key things was the 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 sort of the particularly with young men the how how easy it is to go off the rails and how you know focused they often have to be to really you know make a conscious effort to you know, to try and stay mentally healthy and to try and find ways through something difficult that aren't, you know, alcohol or drugs or self-destructive behavior. And that was something that um, I wanted, um, you know, Kieran as a main character, you know, has, um, has achieved to some degree. He, you know, he, he, is, he has actually been able to sort of focus and, and try and push through um, a little bit. But at the same time, um, you know, returning home kind of naturally, I think, you know, we've all experienced that when you, you know, feelings in the past kind of resurface when you're in a familiar situation. Um, and that's the case with him as well. And he's been very fortunate in his partner too. I mean, Mia is a very understanding young woman. I mean, she comes from the same town. She knows what's happened. And she seems totally, utterly supportive. Um, and her, her comments about the male relationships that that are, are such an weird. But I've taught I've taught adolescent boys. I can see how convincing your your adolescent boys are and how they interact with each other. And I just wondered what research you had done to do to create this convincing sense of these young men. Yeah, you know, I think with the um, the young guys, a lot of that was just observation, really. Um, you know, I, I think um, sometimes when you know when I'm quite often I find myself having to write characters that I don't I don't really um, I haven't lived their lives personally, um, and you know the thing I always sort of try and you know focus on with that rather than focusing on kind of I guess the differences between their their lived experiences and mine is try and focus on those shared things. So for example, you know, as, um, you know, as, as young, um, I think young men and young women do have different teenage years experiences, but at the same time, we all kind of know what it's like to feel a bit, you know, insecure at a party or a bit left out by your friends or um, a bit like you have to, you know, you have to maybe be a certain way to feel like, you're keeping up with everybody. And um, I guess it's those sort of, those sort of experiences that kind of resonates um, on a pretty universal level uh, at the kind of things I try and focus on when I'm you know, writing about someone that um, doesn't necessarily kind of, you know, I guess share my, my current lifestyle. Yeah. And then there's Verity, another strong mother. I mean, after the strong mother in The Lost Man, you've got another strong mother, a mother who, um, has got many different things, and you describe her brittle, the brittle face of her constant, unceasing, grinding strive for inner serenity. It's a beautiful sentence, and it really does sum her up so well. And you also talk about her active listening, which she's she has learnt to do as a result of what's happening to her. So tell us a little about Verity and about her role in this story. Yeah, sure. So um, Verity is um, Kieran's mother, who is 
um, still, you know, still relatively young um, for a, you know, for a grandmother, um, but is sort of weighed down by a lot of, um, you know, her, her, you know, experiences and the challenges she's facing. Uh, not least of which is her husband, who is also a relatively young man, but has um, in the grips of quite advanced dementia and is really lost to her in many ways. Um, and I think that was, you know, that sort of, um, I guess, that, again, that, that theme of kind of, you know, grief and regrets um, surface in Verity in a different way than they do in Kieran. And that was one of the things I, I, I want to sort of draw out, this fact that people do have different reactions to things. And for Verity, she's turned very much sort of inward to, you know, self-help and support groups and, um, you know, and maybe, um, you know, on the surface seems fine um, in a lot of ways, but um, underneath is, you know, is, is struggling. Yes, she is. She is really. And then there's another character, rather lovely character, which is Baby Audrey. And in your comments, you say you've based Baby Audrey on your own little boy, your own baby, Ted. So the question immediately popped into my mind, did you really have a baby and write this book at the same time? Yeah, no, I did, absolutely. Um, oh. Which is, um, <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing, it was really hard. <laughs> but, um, it was, um, yeah, so I have, um, so I have, I have a four-year-old daughter as well. And then I had, um, I had my second child, who's yeah, my little boy, um, in uh, November last year. And so I, I uh, so I, I knew, I knew early on, I knew I wanted Kira to, to be a father and I knew I wanted to have this kind of um, family responsibility, both from above with his own father and from below with his new, you know, his new child, which I think, you know, any of us who've, um, who've had children will remember that first baby is an absolute, up, you know, the upheaval that, you know, <laughs> gives you. Um, I, it was something I really wanted to kind of draw in. in. And um, so he, um, so he has his his baby daughter with him throughout much of the book, and um, and and I um, so I was pregnant when I was writing this book, and I um, I kind of finished this sort of um, finished that first draft I was talking about, and I submitted it for you know, structural edits, and then that's the point at which I I go to on my research trip when I've got the you know the the time to um, I've got the opportunity to really sort of structurally edit it based on you know the the research and and the feedback. Um, and so I, I gave, so I gave birth and I had to go to Tasmania at this certain sort of point. So, so I had this 12 week old baby myself, hmm. um, well, me and my husband and our toddler daughter all went down. And, um, so yeah, a lot of the, you know, the scenes of, you know, Kieran kind of sort of walking through the sand with the, the baby strapped to his chest is a, a very much, you know, <laughs> very much based on my own experiences. Um, which I think, you know, I like to think help, you know, gave it kind of a, a certain ring of authenticity, but um, um, yeah, it was, um, so, so Baby Audrey was kind of, is a character quite close to my heart. And she certainly has a personality all of her own. She's not just a baby being carried around. She, she reacts and, and anyway, when you read the book, you'll see her. Then there's two really interesting characters and I want to talk to you about them for this, there's a re two, two reasons to talk about George Barlin, but the first one is his association with Sue Pendlebury, because that not only do they discover vital clues, but they're actually real people. And I was fascinated to read about this, so perhaps you could tell us how Sue Pendlebury and George Barlin, who are not a police detective or a writer, actually came to be in your story. Yeah, sure. So um, I was um, invited to uh, speak at a, um, a fundraising lunch in Sydney. Um, so it would have been last year, actually. Yeah, last year um, in aid of Bernardos, the children's um, children's family charity. And as part of that, um, they asked if I would be willing to auction um, auction a name um, to appear in a book, which I was happy to to do because you know it's a really important course and it raises a lot of money for you know a lot of really um, really you know important projects. So um, yeah, so we had this um, had this auction and Sue Pendlebury, um, who I believe is an oncologist um, in real life, was um, the the highest bidder, and she um, she actually um, 
but you know, bid, uh, on behalf of her, her son, who is, um, who is George. But I thought Sue Pendlebury was such a great name as well that I, um, I, I offered to include them both because um, I just thought, you know, I, I had those characters really sort of firmly in mind and I wanted to, um, you know, I wanted to give them characters who I think have quite a lot of depth and a really important role in the story. Um, so those seemed like a really good fit. They're also outsiders and it, it, it's fascinating to watch the reaction of the small community to an outsider as well. I mean, that's what happens. And so we would have to, if we wanted to be in one of your books or our name, we'd have to go to an auction. I think so, yeah. It's not something I give away lightly, I have to say. Um, I can imagine. You know, it's because um, I think the names are, are quite important. And, you know, they when you think of names for characters as well, it, it's sort of, um, it you know, it, you need them to kind of reflect all kinds of things, like you know, the, the character's age, the, you know, where, like where they're from, what kind of, I guess, what kind of family they're they're in like you know their first name has to match their surname for example um you you also need the names to be different enough that they're recognizable to the reader so you know you don't want names that are too close together in sound or or you know letters so that when the reader's reading especially if they're reading fast they kind of get that instant recognition and they can they can um they can attach that name to that character quite easily so i find names like quite you know, thinking names takes up quite a lot of time and I, I sort of go through quite a few different variations before I settle on them. Um, so I was, I was um, so it's not something, yes, yeah, so it's not something I give away lightly at all. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, and I was, I was, I was lucky, I think, that um, Sue and George had such, you know, I thought really, really good names for fiction and, and they fit in really well with the story. And let's let's talk about George because George is an interesting character in many ways. Um, it has been suggested that in fact George is you, and that you've placed yourself you've placed yourself in the story <laughs> because he's an ex journalist as you are, and he's a bestseller too. Except his bestsellers are quite different to the books you write, and you have him say some quite interesting things. Like for instance, he says, I only take criticism from people I go to for advice. So is George you, are, is, is, are, are elements of George you in this story? Um, I think there are definitely elements um, of me, um, it, although I would probably say there are elements of me in probably all the characters because, you know, they have to come from somewhere and that somewhere is essentially, you know, my own, you know my own thoughts my own experiences um but i mean with george probably the likeness is is maybe a bit more pronounced in that he is as you said like he's, a, he's an author um he's a former journalist and um he you know so i suppose uh, there are times when i think uh, his his thoughts and mine do you know align quite closely um that being one of them that 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 you know quote you just um pulled out there um but i think um you know with all the characters i guess you know in the books it's really important for me that i think to make sure that all the characters pull their weight with the story. So I really, um, you know, I, I don't have any characters who don't have a role and they all have to be doing something. And, and that's not going to be the same thing. And some of them, you know, do more than others, but they all, they're all kind of there for a reason. And I mean, you know, um, George, you know, as you said, he, um, he's an outsider. And I think when he's, you're, you're, writing about a small community you have that mix of kind of insiders and outsiders um if, if you're talking sort of purely from a plot point of view because having people who have different you know connections and experiences and backgrounds of a town allow them to make different observations and notice different things and give the reader different information um, than they would if they all were coming at an event from the same point of view so purely from a, a completely technical point of view. That is, um, you know, why someone like George would, you know, be, be a, you know, created within the book. Um, and then I guess from a creative point of view, you know, we've got a small, um, a small coastal town, you know, you want outsiders, an outsider to come in and, you know, there's, there's a few options for what, what that person could do and what could draw them there. But, um, I, you know, I, I felt like, you know, a writer looking for inspiration, especially when he, you know, has a, a bit of um, 
uh, ties to the, to the town himself um, for various reasons um, seemed like just a really sort of a really good opportunity just to yeah add an extra kind of element to the to the um, to the book. You also have Kieran say when he when he sees Balin, you have him say you have him remembering that Balin had I want to get this right had been on a panel with two women authors and spoken for easily half the time. Is this based on your experience too, that male authors nominate panels? Um, look, I've seen it happen more than once. Um, it, it, I have to say, it, it doesn't, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not sort of, um, it's not something that has happened to me sort of recently, you know, but um, I think anybody who's ever been to a festival has probably seen that happen from time to time. It was just a rather lovely little comment because when we go, we, you, you do recognise what goes on. Now, let's go back to, you, you said at the start that you tend to start with the place or the, the setting. So you've answered, the, I had a question about where you start with plot, plot character or, or, or the setting. And I just wondered with this novel, whether it was um, the storm, that you started with the storm in your head and the way the storm could have such an impact on so many people. Well, no one had come through the storm unscathed. So did you begin with Tasmania and then the storm, or did you have the storm in your head as something that could have this ripple effect? Um, actually, probably neither, really. So actually, what, um, what I actually really start with is, um, is probably um, the end of the book. And when I said setting, so... Um, uh, so I apologize, I probably wasn't clear actually with the setting. The setting comes really almost simultaneously with that. That's like a, that's, that's something I'm thinking about almost at the same time. Um, but the plot is probably what comes first and then that, that would then um, help, you know, give me a, a really clear idea quite early on of where the setting's going to be. So they're, they're, they're kind of simultaneously. But in terms of the, um, the kind of core idea, when I'm thinking about a book and when I'm sort of trying to work out what I'm going to write about, the thing I'm often thinking about um, really is the end of the book, what, what becomes the end of the book. And that is the a kind of a, an, an event um, where people have been pushed into extreme circumstances. And, you know, and, and those circumstances can be so varied. I mean, it really does a, does a that's, that's, I guess, the question I'm, I'm sort of trying to answer when I'm, you know, planning a book, what, what has driven, you know, people um, to this point where, you know, something extreme has happened between them. And, and, and that could be all kinds of things, you know, it could be something recent, it could be something that's been like long brewing. Um, it could be, you know, a, a sort of a set of circumstances. Um, it could just be, you know, unlucky. So there's all kinds of ways you can get people to that point. And I'm thinking about what's, what is that extreme circumstance and what is their relationship and, and why have they come to this? And then um, once I've kind of that's I've sort of got an idea that kind of settles and feels like yes, this is this is something that I can see has enough, you know, avenues and and opportunity to kind of build it up. Um, then I start thinking about um, okay, so so how we how do we get to this point, and what characters do I need to, you know, kind of. Um, you know, tell the story, you know, so you need the main character and you'll, that main character will have probably some, you know, a family of some sort and they'll have, um, you know, they'll have friends and acquaintances and, you know, they, they might have a partner or they may not or children or they may not, you know, so you're sort of thinking about um, the whole kind of, you know, this sort of cast that you need to, to, to kind of let the main character, I guess, go through that story in the way they need to. And then, uh, you know, and then really one of the, the, the last things I'm sort of thinking about is where I'm going to start the book and where I kind of drop the reader into this, you know, this scene and this set of circumstances. So they, they drop in at a point that's going to grab them and is, is going to, at that point, kind of um, pull them all the way through to this end point. And the whole book is kind of funneling towards this this conclusion um, and that's that's kind of how I structure it so in fact every book you write you start with the end yeah I do yeah um, it's, it's taken me um, I probably only really realized that was um, you know 
that was the way I did it with the lost man. It, that was when it became really clear to me that was how my planning process was working. But that's that's how I did it with all of them. Um, I think just you know when you when you're starting when you're starting out writing, you know your your kind of um, your techniques and your you know the way you kind of approach a novel isn't. Um, it, you know, isn't as clear as it becomes the more novels you write. So, um, you know, a lot of the time, you know, you, you're kind of trying to work out how, you know, how, how your writing practice works. Um, and, it, and it sort of has become place, increasingly clear to me over the four books that um, when I plan and when I feel an idea settles, it's um, definitely in those initial stages, it's actually the end point, which is what I'm looking at. So now I actively... Now I actively think about the end point when I'm thinking about a new book. Well, that explains the drama, the drama of your conclusions. I mean, it really does. I mean, that, that, I'm so glad I asked that question because I, I don't think I've ever heard you say that before. So it's terrific. I think also just for anybody out there who might be writing writing a book, I think one of the real benefits of that as well is that you know that um you, you know that the book will work because you know if you're writing especially something with a bit of a mystery, um you know, it's, I think it's really easy to kind of write yourself into a corner. If, you, if you're kind of starting from the start and you have this great opening with this kind of event that, you, you know, how, how, how can this possibly resolve itself? Like at some point you have to resolve it. And, and I think, you know, we've all read books where I think it's become clear that the author has not been able to really resolve it satisfactorily, you know. So, but if you, if you start at the end and you think about the end point, like everything you do builds around that. So every red herring and every twist and turn and all the characters and everything is kind of, is kind of, you know, manufactured and geared around this point. So, you know, you know, you know, that you can really do anything you want to around that because you know that the ending will work. And that's why your novels are also like this, this sort of onion that you unpeel, that you unpeel things and you come to this, drama at the end which is the center and that's why it's so successful oh thank you yes yeah, it's, it's honestly it's a lot easier i think to add in red herrings and you know distractions and things if you know where you're going with it because you can you can actually have a lot of fun with it and you can you can pick the most kind of gripping start you know you can you can find you can you can be really like um you have the whole luxury of thinking like you know you know, where, where in this whole character's lives and, and their interactions, where am I going to start this book, which is the most interesting part to, you know, to then, you know, draw through to this conclusion that you, you, you know, you know, you're working towards. So, um, you know, it's, it, yeah, I personally just find it a lot easier to kind of work it, you know, work it backwards and start at the start and kind of hope it all works out at the end. And that explains the structure of the novel too. And when people pick it up, they'll know what we're talking about. Before we go, we have to go to questions in a minute. I really do have to ask you about the film. Oh yeah. Film, which with Eric Banner. And I heard, I listened to the launch and I heard that you have a part in it too. So tell us, when's it going to be released and about your role in this major motion? Yeah, so um, I believe um, so. I so I believe it was it's penciled in for April next year. Although I've I've actually just heard that the James Bond film is now being rescheduled for April. So I think oh. that might that that might um, change matters a little bit because I'm not sure anybody really wants to go head to head with um as, yeah as wonderful as the film is. <laughs> like I think you know, James Bond might might dominate the cinemas that week. Um, so but. The film is done. It's completed. It was filmed last year, so 2019, in northwest Victoria, um, in a, a lot of like really small kind of you know, communities, um, which is great. Which is where kind of the fictional you know, town in the dry was set. Um, and I got invited to go up there and be um, an extra in the funeral and the wake scenes, which was really fun. So if you look out um, for me, you have to look hard, I mean, it's about half a second, but I've seen the second row of the funeral and I'm holding a, a, a warm glass of white wine at the, in the village hall for the wake. So um, that was my kind of big acting moment. Um, but, you know, it was amazing. Like I got to meet Eric Banner and I um, got to see them kind of, you know, filming it and meet all the cast. And, uh, and then I got to see the finished film earlier this year, um, luckily just before lockdown, actually, they, they, they showed, showed it to me. And, um, you know, it was, it's really amazing. It's such, it's such a fantastic film. And I'm so delighted because I think, you know, when you hand over your book to be made into a film, it's a real kind of, 
leap of faith and um you know i i just i'm so blown away with what i've done with it it's a really sort of beautiful thoughtful thrilling adaptation and i think they've captured all the high points and all the kind of emotion of the characters and the setting it's beautifully shot so well put together um so if it's in april or whenever it comes out um definitely if you enjoy the book you know definitely um, make an effort to go and see it because i think you'll really really like it that's great. I, I do hope James Don Bond doesn't hold it up. Yeah, I, just, I mean, people here would go to see it without without a blink, but I presume they're looking at world worldwide release and James Bond. So, and actually, I am going to go to questions, but one more, one more. Folk, are you going to bring him back? Yeah, I, I will. I, I think I'll bring him back for certainly for one more. Um, the the only reason I really haven't done it him uh, in the last couple of books is just because, like I was saying, when I when I think of, when I think about a plot, you know, and and how it's going to work, I think it's really obvious to me, you know, if 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 it that he didn't have a role in the Lost Man yeah. and the Survivors, you know, that the characters just were not the right place for him, um, and he would have been completely sort of shoehorned in, and so um, you know, it's really important to have those those right characters. But um, I do have. Um, I have kind of got a bit of a thought of, for him um, that I'm sort of, well, after I, I finish, I'll, I'll sort of be, is one of the things I'll be kind of deciding whether to develop or not. Like I've got a few ideas and sort of, um, you know, I'll be, I'll be trying to decide which one, you know, I think, you know, is, is worth sort of working up. And I have got one which I think would work um, actually pretty well for him. So, um, yeah, so um, he will return. It's just, it's just finding that kind of really, you know, that perfect yeah. opportunity for him. Good. So we have some questions from our from our virtual audience. And this one is from Lorraine. And she asks, do you pick topical issues to build a story around and explore? And you have got a few topical issues in here with dementia and P P P S oh, I always get it wrong, PSTD. You you have got they are topical. So do you do you look for them to include in your story? Yeah, no, thanks, Lorraine. No, it's a good question. And um, the answer is actually no, not really. Um, so um, I never I never set out to write um, about a certain theme. And I, I don't really, um, you know, it's not something in my planning process. It's not really something that, um, that I, I, I actually dedicate any real time to. Um, what, I, what I always do is I focus first, like I say, on the plot and the characters and, you know, making sure the whole structure works. And then what it is, is really when... Um, I'm starting to think about the characters in more detail because for a long time they're quite two-dimensional and they're there to kind of fulfill a role and then as part of the, the sort of process it comes to a point where I'm starting to kind of flesh them out and I think a lot about their backgrounds and their relationships and what their lives are like and it's really then that I think the themes really start to develop because you know as part of building those characters in an authentic way you're trying to think about yeah, what issues are affecting them and what um, kind of things are, you know, troubling them or, you know, conversations they're having. And um, I think part of being authentic is trying to capture those things um, that then become recognisable contemporary themes because as real people, we, we do experience them and we talk about them and we read about them and they impact our lives to various degrees. So that's, so the themes are always driven by the characters. Um, and I never, I never sort of um, force the characters to do anything to develop a theme. I, I always just try and let the theme develop to whatever degree it's going to based on what the characters need to do. Um, so that, that's kind of, because I just think that's a bit more natural and it feels, you know, better. It's a, it's a better reading experience for the reader when things sort of are allowed to, I think, emerge rather than um, being, you're deliberately kind of forced in. And this one, this one is um, from Bernadette and she asks, what is it about the Australian landscape that inspired you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, you know, look, I mean, the Australian landscape is such a, you know, it, it like it has so many opportunities for writers. And I think, um, you know, when I first started to, you know, when I go back to when I first started writing The Dry, you know, I, I just thought I'm going to write the kind of book that I would like to read. And I thought, you know, I'd love to read something really set in kind of like a really, you know, strong Australian setting with these characters that um, kind of 
you know, I guess recognizable. And, um, and I think, um, you know, it's like Australia is, I mean, every country is unique to itself, but Australia has such a kind of really diverse, you know, geography. And, um, and I think the geography often really um, drives the people, you know, so your lifestyle is quite heavily influenced by where you live, especially when we get outside of the urban areas. Um, and so that was something that I just think really lends itself like very, very well to, to books that have a bit of um, kind of mystery and suspense and tension because often the landscape kind of has its own hazards and, and that can really, you know, do like a lot of heavy lifting for, for me in certain ways by um, just putting these characters into these landscapes that have um, a bit of, you know, brutality and danger to them. And that's why each, each of your books are so different too because the landscape is so different and produces such different reactions. Now this is what from Matt and she, she asks, what inspires you to write? And I think you've answered that to the second part of the question, which is where do you draw inspiration from? Yeah, so what inspires me to write? I guess, you know, look, I mean, you know, I, I guess like I, you know, right now it's because I enjoy it. Um, and I think um, the, you know, when I was, when I, for each book, I suppose it's a little bit different because it's always a different experience. You know, when I was running the dry, um, you know, I'd always been a big reader as a child and I'd love books and I, I, you know, I always loved reading and I always thought I'd love to write a book. I'd love to write a book that people love to read, you know, and that was kind of something that um, I'd kind of carried with me for a lot of years. I'd never done anything about it really. So I was always you know, working full time as a journalist and just, you know, felt sort of too busy and, um, and I wasn't honestly sure how to start. Um, but it, it got to the point, I think, where the, the fear of regrets became um, bigger than, um, you know, bigger than the fear of um, failure, I suppose. You know, so I, I kind of thought I, I really want to give it a try because, you know, at least then I've, at least then I've tried and I've, I've kind of achieved this thing that I've been wanting to do for years. And if it doesn't get published and nobody reads it, like, that's okay. At least I'll have given it a shot, you know. So that was kind of, I guess, the motivation for the dry. And then... Um, you know, um, you know, I really have, you know, sort of this amazing opportunity now to write more books and, you know, have um, contracts and I know that they're going to get published and, um, you know, so I think, you know, now I'm in a really fortunate position where, it, you know, it's, it's because I, I really just love writing and I love um, being able to kind of, you know, create stories that I, I do think that I would like to read. Um, and you know, in terms of the inspiration, I think it's always, um, it's always different. And I think often the inspiration for a book, sometimes by the time I've gone through the whole writing process is actually very different from maybe how the book turns out. Um, because what I'm looking for in that moment of inspiration is um, the core of an idea that I think I can develop. So I'm not looking for the whole book. I'm not looking for, you know, any whole, you know, particular character or, um, I'm not expecting the whole story to present itself. I'm just looking for an idea that I think has enough opportunity that um, I can develop it. So um, for any writers out there, that's, that's like a good place to start, I think. And the last one we've got actually is from Trish. And she's asking you, I think, about the next book. She's asking you, how do you think of the next book? How do you go about I presume it means how do you go about starting the next book? Yeah, so um, so I'll be starting thinking about the next book quite soon. Um, I tend to, um, like, one of the biggest things I think I've learned about the writing process is it's really important to take things in stages and not necessarily try and rush any particular stage. So, for example, so now The Survivors have just come out and I've got a lot of kind of media and publicity and virtual tours and things to do. So, um, you know, I'm letting myself focus on that and um you know enjoy the book coming out and then when that dies down then i'll start really thinking about the next book and and I'll, what i'll do i'll spend a long time um just thinking and weighing up kind of different ideas and and trying to just find that that sort of one kind of core idea that settles um and i think it's really worth sort of taking that time because you know there's a lot of a lot of time and wasted words, you know, if you kind of rush into an idea that's not 
that's not right. And it can be, for me, it's quite false economy to do that. So, um, so I think about the idea and then I'll start, once I've settled, I'll start to kind of, I do like a, um, a little bit of a, you know, a real skeleton outline. So I'm talking maybe like five or 10 sentences, kind of outlining where the main points of the book as I see them. And then I'll kind of expand those a little bit and I'll keep expanding them to say, you know, so 20 sentences, then 20 paragraphs. And I'll, and I'll start kind of really trying to work out the, the order of the book um, and the characters and how it's going to play out. And then, you know, and then I'll spend a long time refining that, making sure the characters are right, um, making sure I've got, you know, you, you the setting and the, you know, the, ti the timeline and all that kind of things are, are sort of as they, you know, the best way they could be. Um, and I don't actually start writing until um, I've really got everything, I think, structurally in the best place I can get it at that point. Um, and only when I'm pretty sure that's how the book is going to play out, then um, I'll start writing. Um, so I could, I'll spend months and months writing. And as long as I've done a plan well, um, you know, I can, I can actually write the first draft pretty quickly because... It's, then it's just about executing each of those scenes in the best possible way and making it interesting for the reader. And you, you actually said that for The Lost Man, you used Scrivener. Did you use that again? Do you find that a useful tool? Um, kind of yes and no. I did, I, I did use it a bit because it has a, a quite useful kind of um, corkboard tool where you can sort of, you can kind of map out scenes on a... Um, I guess like a virtual corkboard, and you can kind of move things around a little bit and you can see the whole book, um, you know, in, in order. Um, I think though, like I find that program actually quite hard to use and I, and I don't totally trust myself to completely like, have, you know, know that the work is always fully saved and all that kind of thing. And I think it has a lot of features that I don't use, um, but I do use that feature. Um, that's actually not to say though, I think there's probably better ways, there's probably better ways to do that in different programs. And some people find it easier to do that, like maybe physically, you know, with actual pieces of paper on a court board or in a word file. But my, um, my sort of technology is pretty um, kind of basic by choice, I think. So, I mean, I just, you know, I just use normal word um, for a lot of my notes and, um, you know, I think the most important thing is to kind of have confidence that you can find things when you need them. You have like, you know, you have a really good kind of filing system to save your various notes and drafts and, you know, back it up. <laughs> like like the, that's, that's like a lot of, a big part of writing, I think, is, is getting that admin stuff right. And as boring as it sounds, um, you don't want to pour your heart and soul into, you know, something really, really creative only to lose it because, you know, your USB stick breaks or something like that. So um, do the boring admin stuff as well is um, a really key piece of um, advice for me. Be prepared and then write. Yeah. Yes. That's right. <laughs> well, we've got about five minutes before we're due to finish. So how about we just have one more question and then we'll finish. Um, and I know we've asked this before, but all of your heroes so far have been male. Um, is this conscious? Have you, have you ever thought about a female detective or a, a female main character who would work out what's going on? I mean, in this story, you've got Sue Pendlebury, who's really quite a, she's a clever woman and, and she, gets, she gets to what has happened. Did you ever think about writing it from her perspective? rather than doing it from Kieran's. Yeah, look, I mean, the, the choice of having all male characters so far has been a really conscious choice. Um, and I, I mean conscious in the sense that, uh, you know, it's definitely something that yeah, I consider really closely. Um, you know, I consider it um, closely for a few reasons, but not least because I have, you know, now I have, a, I have a daughter and I have a son who one day will be old enough to read these books. And I, and I ask myself, you know, what will I, what will I say, you know, if my daughter asked me exactly that question, like why, you know, why have you chosen male characters? Um, and um, yeah, the answer, and I, and I feel quite comfortable with the answer to that. And the answer is it's always plot driven. And part of that is, yeah, as part of the planning process, I'm always really thinking about who is going to provide the best overview and perspective of this story. And sometimes that's, um, and that is often like quite a technical question because you need someone who has um, certain connections with the place and certain connections with, um, you know, the whole cast of characters can provide insight, can provide sort of some sort of fresh eyes. Um, and also from a purely practical point of view, can do things that um, 
sometimes the female characters can't, I think, cannot do naturally. So, for example, Kieran can go, Kieran can go walking through that town at night without a second thought. His, his, um, his partner, um, she can't. And so yeah. she, she is limited in some ways by her natural caution um, in terms of what she can, you know, what she would feel naturally comfortable doing as part of her character. So, that, so you need a character who has those, that kind of, those options. Um, and sometimes things like, for example, in The Lost Man, you know, the, when I went up there and, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time kind of speaking to people on, say, cattle stations about the, the, the makeup of those stations. And, you know, you... I think it's really important to kind of reflect things like that, you know, in an authentic, genuine way as well. So sometimes it's driven by the practicalities of the situation. Um, but having said that, I think absolutely, like, I mean, I, you know, for sure would think, you know, I will write female lead characters. Um, it's, you know, there will be stories that completely lend themselves to that and present themselves. So, um, you know, whenever I have a story, I, I only really have one idea, one good idea at a time. And in, in all these cases, this has been the, the most practical way to do it. But um, yeah, I really look forward to kind of finding, you know, those stories that, um, yeah, let me, let me, you know, explore those other characters as well. Well, thank you, Jane, very much for your time tonight. It's been wonderful talking to you. It's been an absolute privilege. And thank you so much for coming. I learned a lot. And just to remind people that the book is available at the ANU's Harry Hartog Bookshop. Go out and buy it. It's a, it's a great read. Thank you, Jane, very much. Thanks, Anne. Thank you so much for coming as well. No, it's been a pleasure. Been a pleasure.